Hey family, this is Sarah Jakes Robertson. I am so excited about the incredible word that you're about to receive. There are just a few things I want to tell you before we dig into the word. Number one, let's make this thing official. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You're already plugged in. Make sure you don't miss anything that comes out of this house. The second thing, did you know that it's more than just videos? We are doing so much to help the community and we want you to partner with us in literally changing the world. Give into this ministry so the fruit of it is incredible. The instructions are on the screen. Make sure that you are a part of what God is doing through One Online. Lastly, my husband's book, Balance, is coming out, and I am so excited. And I got a gift for you. You will get the first three chapters of the book by going to the link below when you pre-order. Pre-order the book. You don't want to miss it. It has tremendously blessed my life, and I can't wait for you to see what I've already partaken in. Balance is going to rock this world. Okay, let's get into the word. What's up, Activate family? You know I had to come through. Let me tell you something. Pastor Stephanie, Pastor Ab, and these throwbacks have been holding it down. But I've been praying and I've been before the heart of the Lord and I said, God, I'm ready to activate something. Sometimes we need seasons where we take time to just receive and reflect and to allow God's made to be made perfect within us. And I've been in one of those seasons where I'm not so busy delivering the word that I don't receive a word. And that means that I am excited about a word that I did receive because I am beginning to allow my spirit to function in overflow. My body may be tired, sometimes my energy is depleted, but there is nothing like having a spirit that is living in the overflow. And my prayer is that as we are together, that God would activate overflow in your life, that God would activate that more that you've been waiting for. That's what I'm gonna be preaching about. I'm so excited. I need God to bring it all together because I haven't preached in a while. And when you haven't preached in a while, it just lives in your head until it comes out your mouth and you don't know what it's going to sound like. So please pray for me as I deliver this word. Pray that God would just make it make sense for you and for anyone who needs it. Let's get into it, family. I am in John 16. I'm starting in verse 7. This is the New King James Version. And this is Jesus before he is preparing to go to the cross. He has spent time with the disciples. He's performed miracles. He's healed the sick, the blind see, the lame walk. But now it's time for him to go to the cross. This is what we would call in our modern colloquialisms a plot twist for the disciples. You see, the disciples thought that they were going to be following Jesus and just being a part of Jesus' ministry. But Jesus has come to a point where he allows them into the extra layer. And that extra layer means that their job is done in following him. It's time for him to go to the cross. It's time for him to go be with his father, which means that they're going to be left holding exposure, experiences, but no leader as they have known it. My subject for those of you who like to take notes or want to come see this video later is getting more out of life getting more out of life. The disciples have experienced more, but now they're living in the threat that the more that they have experienced is going to be taken away. Has anyone ever been there where you finally are living in the more, but for some reason you lose the job, you move to another city, someone passes away, and the more is being taken away. The space that they are in when Jesus says this to them, is that of one that is full of grief. Because who wants to let go of more? Who wants to go back to the way things were? John 16 verse 7 begins and Jesus says to them, Nevertheless, I'm actually going to go up a verse. I want to go to verse 5. It says, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? 
But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. He says, you're so sad that I'm leaving that you haven't even asked where I am going. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I'm going to answer what you didn't even ask. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. This continues and goes on and on as Jesus begins to prepare their heart for his departure. How fitting it is that we are coming upon Easter when this originally airs. And many of us are going to be reflecting on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But for tonight, for this moment that we are together, for this moment that you are viewing the video, I want you to indulge me in imagination. And let's pretend that you don't know the end of the story. Let's for a moment be the disciples, exposed to more and then losing it. Wondering where do we go from here and how do I pick up the pieces? And it is from that heart posture that I want us to receive this word because Jesus breathes fresh life into them. And I believe that Jesus is going to breathe fresh life into you. Not after you have experienced the resurrection, not after you have experienced what's on the other side, but right now in the tension of the sorrow, in the tension of the loss, in the tension of the confusion, I believe God's going to meet you. Spirit of the living God, we welcome you. We welcome you to confront the areas within us that feel grief and sorrow, that feel disappointment and anxiety, the inadequacy and the insecurity spirit of the living God. Have an encounter with the living insecurity that rules my life. Have an encounter with the living fear, the living doubt, the living worry that shows up in my life. And because you are a living God, I know that if you have an encounter with those living darknesses within me, that your light will shine so brightly that there will be no doubt that those fears, those insecurities, those worries and anxieties are nothing in comparison to your glory. So Father, let your glory fall Wherever this video is played, wherever this message is heard, let there be great glory, God. And may we fall deeper in love with you because we see that you never leave us without a next. Thank you, God, that this word will flow without fear, without nerves, without anxiety, and that it will be anointed and appointed to reach every person connected to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When I was growing up, I was born in the 80s, but the end of the 80s, so I'm more like a 90s baby. There was this movie that came out. I'm pretty sure this movie came out in the 2000s. Maybe it came out in the late 90s. Google it, you'll figure it out. But this movie changed my life. It changed the way that I showed up in the world. It changed the way that I saw people. And this movie was The Truman Show. Um, I know that some of you are probably thinking to yourself, there was nothing life-changing about The Truman Show, and you're wrong. You are dead wrong. The Truman Show had me convinced that I was on set. Everything suddenly made sense. I was thinking to myself, I said, self, wow, these people are actors. They're clowns. They're not actually real people. The only problem is that I'm about, you know, 30 plus years into the Truman Show that is my life, and I'm pretty sure that this is real. I'm pretty sure that we're not acting and that there is no set and there is no camera somewhere going to let me know that this is all for show. Instead, I've begun to believe that my life may actually be more like, like um, an escape room, you know? Because sis is lost, I am sis. 
Sis is confused sometimes. I am, sis. And sis also believes that there is someone on the outside who's got it so much easier, who has figured it all out and is cruising by while I am struggling. Sometimes it feels like I am living in an escape room. Is that anyone's testimony? Don't leave me out here. I need you to type it in the comments. Me too, girl, me too. I went to an escape room with our team and I've gone to an escape room with our family before. And we go into this escape room and I'm sitting there and I realize that it is going to be impossible for us to figure out how to escape this room unless we have two fundamental beliefs. I now believe that those two fundamental beliefs are also necessary for us to survive the escape room that is life. And if you think about it, we started in heaven. If we live right and confess Jesus as our Savior, we're going to end in heaven. So we are trying to escape this thing and make it to the other side, and that other side is glory. But we got to figure out what are the two fundamental principles we need to have in mind in order for us to continue to navigate this escape room that is life with this confusion with its hidden doors, with its plot twists, with its details that we often overlook, with the things we have to go over and redo. And those two fundamental principles are this. One, you have to believe that there is more. So when you're in this escape room, a clock is not just a clock. A wall is not just a wall. A book is not just a book. You have to believe in this idea that everything in this room could mean something important to me. It could be important to how I make it to the next stage. It could be important to how I figure things out. And the issue that most of us have is that we're in these circumstances, we're in our lives, we're in our communities, we're in our relationships, and we have given up on the belief that there is something more connected to the moment we are standing in. We fall into the thinking that there is perhaps something random or coincidental about the experiences that we have possessed, but the reality is that there is always something more connected to it. Maybe my job in this moment at the grocery store is to be a light. Maybe my job when I'm at this facility that I work in is to make sure that I am helping them to create better strategies. What is the more connected to this moment? You got to believe that there's more. Some of us do believe that there's more. We just think that the more is assigned to other people. That for us, we could just sit down and live in this trapped space because being trapped is better than failing at more. And so we stay and convince ourselves that we don't believe that we can do any better, that we don't believe that we can forgive, that we stay trapped in the rooms that keep us from fulfilling our potential because being, believing in more is expensive. Believing in more requires vulnerability. Believing in more means I've got to be willing to take risk and to get it wrong. And so, no, I don't want to be in a relationship. No, I don't want to go out for the promotion. No, I don't want to go back to school. No, I don't want to speak. No, I don't want to write the book. No, I don't want to start the ministry. No, I don't want to apply for the promotion. It's not that I really don't want it. I just don't want to risk the vulnerability connected to it. But I hear God saying that if you are ever going to discover the more that God placed in you, then you're going to have to believe that there is more. You're going to have to begin to pull levers that you would have never pulled, have relationships that you would have never had relationships you're going to have to have conversations and communication that you would have never had before because you believe that, you, that there is more. There is something powerful about someone who has committed to a lifestyle of looking for more. I'm looking for more. I don't mean being desperate. I don't mean being an opportunist, but I mean not just taking any experience and filing it and thinking that there's nothing to it. I believe that there is more to the reason that I went through whatever heartbreak I went through. God, what is the more connected to it? You want to talk about turning pain to purpose? Pain to purpose comes from the belief that there is more to this pain than me just surviving it. There is someone on the other side of it where there's going to be purpose in what I've gone through. The pain of losing a child is terrible. Someone started an organization for mothers who were grieving because they said, I'm not just going to let pain have the final say. I'm going to look for the more connected to the pain. Somebody's got to start looking for more again. I want you to look for the 
the more connected to your heartbreak. Look for the more connected to your grief. Look for the more when you come to this job. I don't want to just do enough to get by. I want to see where is there an opportunity for more because I am assigned for more. I am anointed for more. Anytime I finish preaching a message, I go back through my head and I think to myself, what more could I have done? Because next time I get an opportunity to share the gospel, I want to tap into the more. When I'm serving my children, when I'm serving my husband, I'm thinking to myself, what more can I add to your life? What more can I do to make you feel seen? What more can I do to make you feel valued? Because I recognize that part of my posture in life is to believe in more. I believe in more. I'm not able to give up, and I didn't realize this. Even when I was depressed as a teenager, even when I was depressed when I dropped out of college, I still believed in more. I was waitressing at a strip club, still believing that more. I was going circling jobs in the newspaper because I still believed in more. God, I don't believe that this is the end for my life. God, I don't believe that the statistics are right. God, I'm going through a divorce, but the divorce can't go through me because I'm believing for more. I feel like somebody needs to tap into the mindset that there's still more. God didn't keep you alive for you to be deduced. God kept you alive because multiplication is still possible. And when you believe that multiplication is still possible, you look at every factor expecting more. You look at every solution expecting more. You look at every problem suspecting more. I got to believe that there's more to it than this. I got to believe that there's still greater for me. I got to believe that my faith still has an opportunity to be exercised. I got to believe that there's more to me than what I think I am. I got to believe that there's more than what you say I am. I got to believe that there's more than who they said I was. I got to believe that there's more than who I used to be. I got to believe that there's still more connected to my name. I got to believe that I'm still alive because there's more. That's why the jail couldn't take me. That's why the suicide attempts didn't work. That's why the depression had to let go of me because there is still more. That's why that grief had to get up off of me because there is still more. I'm still walking because there's more. I'm still preaching because there's more. I'm still talking because there's more. I'm still praying because there's more. I'm still worshiping because there's more. And sometimes more hurts. And sometimes more feels expensive. But more feels better than going backwards. So I am looking for more. There's more. There's more. Surviving this season that you're in is going to require the belief that there is more, more in you. I don't even mean more for you. I mean that there's more in you. There's more strategy inside of you. There's more creativity inside of you. And this circumstance and the situations that you are placed in are not to give you more, it's to pull out your more. So when you're in a circumstance and you're in an opportunity and you feel yourself about to shrink, I want to suggest instead that you ask God, God, if you put me in this circumstance, God, if you allow this situation, then there must be more to me than I think there is. So God, help me to tap into the more. I must have more patience than I thought I had. I must have more wisdom than I thought I had. I must have more strategy than I thought I had. I must have more resources than I thought I had. I must have more. I must have more than my mother had. I must have more than my father had. My sister would have never survived this. My friends would have never stood up to this. But God, you place more in me. And before I give up, I got to ask God, what is the more? And when you start asking God for more, heaven starts opening up because heaven says, now I can give you what I've always known about you. Now I can show you what I've been thinking about you. I'm trying to show you that there's more of God's spirit in you than there is the spirit of grief, than there is the spirit of insecurity, than there is the spirit of doubt, than there is the spirit of worry. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying that God's got more. I'm not saying that depression isn't real. I'm just saying that God's got more than depression. God's got more than anxiety. God's got more than fear. God's got more than ego. God's got more than pride. God's got more. I know you got a lot on you. I know you got a lot of shame. I know you've got a lot of worry, but I'm telling you that God still got more grace. God still got more mercy. God still got more anointing. And I believe in God's more. I 
I believe in God's more, more than I believe in my pain. I believe in God's more, more than I believe in this circumstance. I believe in God's more, more than I believe in the fractures, the, te the tears and the, the pain and the stripping. I still believe that God's more is more powerful than all of that because I've seen God's more show up in my life. I gotta believe that there's more and I gotta believe that there's an escape. That when it feels like the walls are closing in on me, God, I believe that there's an escape for this. God, I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm concerned. God, I believe that there's an escape for what I'm feeling in this moment. God, I gotta believe there's more at all times. And I gotta believe that there is an escape at all times. Because when I am armed with that belief that there is more and that there is an escape, I will not allow myself to stay stagnant and restricted in spaces that feel like they are suffocating me. Mindsets and emotions that tempt me into believing that they are suffocating me. I cannot tell you how many times I have found myself in a spiral of shame, a spiral of doubt, a spiral of worry, and I turned on a worship song and actually listened to the words and I was reminded that there's still more. And that itself brought me to a place of escape. No wonder then, we see the disciples in this moment with Jesus. And Jesus is trying to prepare them for a darkness they have never experienced. Jesus is trying to prepare them for a place they've never had to be in before. And this is the station that they are in because they have been exposed to more. They have experienced Jesus functioning in the fullness of his anointing, in the fullness of his identity. And yet they're about to lose that. And their fear is though they have been exposed to more, is that things are going to go back to the way they were. But Jesus, he gives us such insight into how God deals with us. Jesus decides to let them know that help is on the way. God, I wish I could string this together the way I felt it in my head. Before Jesus departs from the disciples, he recognizes that he's leaving them wide open. He's leaving them stretched out, more stretched out than they've ever been, more exposed than they've ever been. We're talking about fishermen. We're talking about people who had no desire within themselves to go traveling from city to city performing miracles, no desire to tread upon the head of serpents, no desire to be anointed. And now all of a sudden, they weren't looking for more, but more found them. That's somebody's testimony right now. They weren't looking for more. They weren't out trying to hustle up on more. Isn't it crazy how God finds those who are not looking for it and then gives them a grace and an anointing that they don't even know what to do with? More finds them. More found Moses. More found David. More finds the disciples. The crazy thing about it all is that the disciples weren't even looking for more. They were totally content in their lives. We're talking about fishermen. We're talking about regular men of the time. They weren't looking for an anointing. They weren't looking for the opportunity to trample upon the head of serpents. They were perfectly fine in their lives, but more found them. Jesus comes up to them and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do you know what that, ex that, what that reveals to me about the mind of God and how God flows through the earth is sometimes more finds you so that it can pull out the more that is in you. When you have an 
opportunity that is on your lap that feels like more than you can handle. I don't have the resources. I don't have the education. I don't have the style or the eloquence in order to step into this more, and yet more found me anyway. You've got to be willing to ask God, what is it about me that you're trying to pull out me? Maybe there is something in me that I don't quite understand. More found the disciples, and more is finding you. More is coming right up to your doorstep. More is making a demand on you, and that's why you were stressed, and that's why you want to quit because you never thought that you even needed more, and now you're in a situation like the disciples where more found you, and you can't give up on more. Let me tell you something about the God that I serve. God is so good that he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That means that if you get a taste of the more that is connected to God, you'll never go back to who you used to be. God knew that if the disciples just had an encounter with Jesus, if they just tapped into the more connected to their identity, that they would never go back to who you used to be. Oh God, I feel the spirit of God on this thing. That if more would not have dropped on your lap, I don't know who I'm prophesying to, but I'm going to drive down your street for a minute. If that more would have never dropped in your lap, you would have never figured out what God knew about you. But because that more dropped on your lap, it gave God an opportunity to show you what he's always known about you. I know you're tired. I know sometimes you feel unstable. I know you're wondering, Lord, what are you going to do with these broken pieces that I have? What are you going to do with all these random experiences? And God says, I'm going to show you the more that I placed in you. There's more, there's more, there's more. There's more, there's more, there's more. There's more than your past. There's more than your pain. There's more than your community. There's still more. You've achieved so much in your life, and yet there's still more. There's still more grace. There's still more anointing. And because you were sleeping on you, I had to bring more to wake you up. Because you didn't believe in you, I had to bring more to break you up. More is trying to shake you up. More is trying to break the way you've been thinking about yourself so that you can receive God's thought about your life. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Do you think that means your thoughts are better? No, boo. It means that God's thoughts are more, which means that if God drops more on your life, it's because God thinks more of you than you think of yourself. And you need to thank God that he never changed his mind about you. I still think more about you after the divorce. I still think more about you after the pain. I still think more about you after the addiction. I still think more. I know everyone else gave up on you, but God still thinks more of you. I know everyone else is turning away from you, but God still thinks more of you. And that's why more keeps finding a way to you. You're watching this message. And I want you to understand something, that I am on assignment tonight that God told me to activate the more. That means that I am driving down your street and I am prophesying over your life because you don't believe in more anymore. But I hear God saying that he's got more for you, that he sees more in you, that there is more for you to do. Don't let more intimidate you. Let more invigorate you. Let it change the way that you show up. Let it change the way that you think. If you let more intimidate you, then you're going to miss that God is calling you to more because God believes in you more. I'm calling you out of that relationship because you're better than that. I'm calling you out of that shame because you're better than that. I'm calling you out of that city because you're better than that, because I put more in you. You're not better than anyone else, but you are better than who you're acting right now. There's more in you. So I'm convicting you so that you transition out of the shrunken state that you've been living in and embrace the more that God has allowed to drop into your lap. Jesus recognizes that the greatest threat to his mission on earth is if the disciples give up just because they're going through a, tra through a tragic season. This is the moment where the disciples could give up, where they could say to themselves, I followed Jesus. I saw what he could do, but that doesn't apply to me. And now that he's gone, I've got nothing to work with. Instead, Jesus leaves them with something powerful to marinate on. Jesus tells them that though I am leaving, I'm sending you help. And when it's all said and done, you're going to be glad that I sent you the help. You're going to be glad that I left you. 
You're going to be glad that I departed from you because what I'm going to give you in exchange is more powerful than me being here with you. This is what Jesus says in the Bible. Can you believe how ridiculous that must have sounded to the disciples? (laughs) Man, I feel great grace on this message. The disciples are already living in more. And Jesus says that when it's all said and done, if you survive this sorrow, that even the more that you are experiencing right now is not going to be anything compared to the more that's on the way. That's a word for somebody who feels like they have maxed out, that they've gone as far as they can go, that they have achieved as much as they can achieve with the history that they have and the tools and the resources that they have had. That word is that if you were still here, if you were still alive, if you were still in pursuit of God's word over your life, then there is still more for you to experience. And you will be grateful that the sorrow you are currently experiencing had the more waiting on the other side. What Jesus says to the disciples in this moment is that I'm going to send you help. The King James Version says, I'm going to send you a comforter. When I looked this word up in the Greek, what I saw was that the word that they translated into helper or comforter actually means advocate. We know this advocate as the Holy Spirit. That means that what Jesus ultimately says to them is that I have to go. I have to leave you so that the Holy Spirit can come and advocate for you so that you can step into what you've already been prepared for. Oftentimes, when we lose access to our mentors or we lose access to those who are leading us, it can make us feel like we are incapable of fulfilling the mission or mandate that is ahead of our lives. It can make us feel incapable of completing or stepping into what we have been exposed to. God help me. Because we have experienced exposures to ways of thinking and being that are often so far beyond us that it feels like the only way we can get there is if I have this person with me. But Jesus says, I did not expose you so that you can then go back to thinking the way that you once thought. Jesus says, not only did I expose you, but I believe that it is possible for you to become what you have been exposed to. And for every area where you feel incapable of becoming what you have exposed to, I'm going to send my spirit to advocate so that you can have backup and belief and trust within yourself that someone else is advocating within you. The Holy Spirit is an advocate. That means that when I can't make up the difference, when I can't figure out the more, that the Holy Spirit is working on my behalf to help me advocate for the more. Where is the more in this? I have to tap into the Holy Spirit to experience the more. I need the Holy Spirit to access the more. I need the Holy Spirit to advocate for my mindset. I need the Holy Spirit to advocate for my prayer life. I need the Holy Spirit to advocate for me. Why do I need an advocate? Because sometimes the situations of life have silenced me. The fears have silenced me. The doubt and the worry is taking over in my mind. It's competing for stage time, competing for air time, and yet the Holy Spirit is advocating on my behalf, advocating to get fear out of the way, advocating to move depression, advocating to get anxiety to clear its head. The Holy Spirit is advocating on my behalf, and sometimes when you don't know what to pray at all, you just need to pray that the Holy Spirit would have an encounter with you. Holy Spirit, I need you to rest on my life. Holy Spirit, I need you to rest over my fear. Holy Spirit, I need you to come into this darkness. Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you. I need your spirit to get more out of life. I don't mean to get more things. I need to see the more. Holy Spirit, touch my eyes. Holy Spirit, touch my mind. 
Holy Spirit, heal my heart. I need an advocate that is greater than the war that is taking place within me. I need an advocate that can speak the words that I won't speak. I need an advocate to help me understand how to get through this escape room that is life. The Holy Spirit is what Jesus says is going to allow the disciples to become what he always knew was possible within them. I was praying and studying for this message, and I felt like God was saying to me that the Holy Spirit is on assignment again, but that we aren't always clear about the prayers that we need to be praying for the direction that we need from the Holy Spirit. And God told me that there are going to be people who are watching this message and Maybe you're like the disciples, and you have found yourself in a sorrowful season. Sorrow is such a complicated word, because though it obviously alludes to sadness, there's a heaviness connected to sorrow. Sometimes we wouldn't call it sad. Sometimes we wouldn't call it depression. We would just, if we're honest, Admit that there's a heaviness connected to how we feel. And Jesus says, I want you to understand that this heaviness is going to have some Holy Spirit advocate that is going to help you lift the weight of the heaviness. I want to pray with you, family. I want to pray for those of you who the moment I said heaviness, It felt like your heart shattered in a thousand pieces because you would have never described what you're feeling as heaviness. I've got a lot of responsibilities now. It's not sorrow, it's heaviness. But maybe it is sorrow. I want to give you permission to feel what you feel Because Jesus doesn't chastise them for being sorrowful. He doesn't punish them. He doesn't roll his eyes and walk away from them. He doesn't remove his word or his promises or his grace or anointing because they feel heavy. Jesus wrestles with their heaviness. What an amazing Savior we have that when we feel sorrowful and we feel heavy, that he'll wrestle with the heaviness on our behalf. The disciples went into this weekend, the Good Friday and the Resurrection Sunday with an undeniable heaviness. And heaviness because they felt like they were losing more. I feel like I'm Jesus, I don't know who you are, but I want you to know I love you. And I want you to know that more is not slipping through your fingers. That you didn't just get out here to be turned away and to go back to the way things were. Your capacity has been stretched by what you have been exposed to. You will never go back to being the person you were again. No more than a rubber band that has been stretched to capacity goes back to its original shape or form. Will you go back to who you used to be after you have been exposed to more? Now being exposed to more and stepping into more are two different things. You got me there. But I also want to let you know that God doesn't expose us to more to then restrict us from more. That this moment with the disciples is a sign that when God exposes you to more, it's because he's preparing you to step into more. If you have been struggling with that step into more, then I want to remind you that you have an advocate through the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is waiting to help you and comfort you and advocate for you 
in a way that Jesus himself said, I cannot do. But if you allow the Holy Spirit, the trifecta of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, if you allow this trifecta to work on your behalf, you won't even need Jesus to show up in the way that He once showed up because you will be so thankful that Jesus left you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm passing the baton. The Holy Spirit has strategy. The Holy Spirit has peace. The Holy Spirit has the ability to lift that weight up off of you. And that's what I feel like I'm called to pray for. Somebody, you're watching this message and you're like, I don't even believe that I'm a Christian. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. But I know what you're saying when you talk about that heaviness. The Holy Spirit can meet you right where you are. And when the Holy Spirit gets finished working, there will be no doubt that the Jesus that is in me reached down into your spirit and became a part of you. So I want you to receive the prayer, to receive what God is doing in this space. Because when you receive the truth of God, when you receive the truth of being seen and the truth of not being alone, then it presents an opportunity for you to also press in closer to Jesus and understanding what it means to be a believer. I'm not even gonna call it a, a Christian, but I believe that when I call upon the name of Jesus, I believe that when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, that he sent me help, that he sent me an advocate, that he sent me a comforter, and I feel that comfort right now. Holy Spirit, what a beautiful spirit you are. Wrapped in peace, overflowing with love, filled with mercy, what a beautiful spirit you are. Holy Spirit, how excellent you are, Holy Spirit. We glorify your name, Holy Spirit. There's truly no spirit like you. I've been battling depression, but there is no spirit like the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I believe that when you fall, the chains break. Holy Spirit, I believe that when I call upon your name, that you can reach into the shores of Africa, that you can reach into the coast of the UK, that you make it all the way to New York. Holy Spirit, I believe that you can be everywhere and right here all at the same time. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would expand your arms and wrap them around every soul that has been feeling the heaviness that comes with more. More responsibility, more weight, more stress, more grace, more peace, more help, more comfort. For a moment, Holy Spirit, can we be the one who needs the help. Holy Spirit, for just a moment, can we be the one that needs the comfort? Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our hearts, into our sorrow, into our heaviness, into our grief, and we receive that your spirit is greater than the spirit of sorrow. Your spirit is greater than the spirit of heaviness. We're praying for a divine exchange. Mm -hmm. That's all that Jesus does in the text. I know I'm supposed to be praying, but tell, that's all that Jesus does in the text. He tells the disciples, I'm gonna make an exchange. My presence for the Holy Spirit. But you're gonna have to release your sorrow of, from losing me so that you can make room for the Holy Spirit. So just like our big brother Jesus, we receive a divine exchange. And we say, here is our heaviness, here is our sorrow. We receive the Holy Spirit as our comforter. We receive the Holy Spirit as the guide that will go ahead of us, that will lead us to truth, that will convict us until we become righteous, 
that will convict us of our sins. Holy Spirit, you have full permission to make our sin uncomfortable. Holy Spirit, you have full permission to remove the opportunities for sin, to remove the opportunities that make us miss the mark. You have full permission to radically shape and change our lives so that we look more like what God had in mind so that we can become more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, hold us in the places where we are most broken. Holy Spirit, hold us together while we hold everyone else together. Holy Spirit, breathe fresh life into us and help us to walk with knowledge, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because we no longer see ourselves as in it on our own or in it by ourselves. But whenever we feel isolated, God, we will be reminded of this word and of the Holy Spirit that will never leave us, never forsake us, and is always available to guide us. Order our steps, give us the strength to take them and the peace to walk away from where we are now. Whether that's a mental walking away, emotional walking away, or physical walking away, God, give us strength to do the right thing so that we can get the more that you have assigned to our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, family. Amen.